Hallelujah, hallelujah, hallelujah. Let's give the Lord one more clap offering. Let's get out of our seats and let's tell somebody we're very happy to see them today. Amen. Jonathan, let uh, Mario know as well when you see him. Hello. God bless you, Miss Dan. How are you? Sister Hilda, how are you? Lord bless you. Well, hallelujah. Wow, hallelujah. hallelujah. All right, I need to pick it up a little bit. Listen, before we get into the word, um, I'm going to ask uh, Jonathan and Mario Naranjo to come up here. Those of you, uh, most of you know, we were out of town for the week. We left Monday morning at 6 a.m. and uh, had got here Friday night. Um, we went to Mississippi in uh, Christ International Church. They have a um, an annual seminar and. Um, in this in this uh, teachings, it was amazing. Um, uh, I'm going to let Mario and Jonathan speak, but I always enjoy going because, first of all, they've patterned their church in the way that I'm looking for the pattern for this church. And I'll just give you an idea. Um, it's not so much that everybody's on salary. What they actually have done is that when money comes in, they buy property and lands around there. And literally, you get out and walk from your front door. You walk over to service into the church. And uh, everybody helps everybody. Everybody, you know, if somebody needs something, somebody has it, they do it. The pastor and the associate pastor, they don't take salary. It's just the church pays whatever bills that they have. And they live off of whatever's there. And uh, it's just amazing. When you're there, they feed you. They have a, a big door that covers the cafeteria. You have the service, and, and they had breakfast, lunch, and dinner. And uh, everybody, it was amazing. What I saw was uh, the ladies were cooking, 
The guys were moving the tables and the chairs. The kids, I mean, this big, were walking around after you ate and said, are you done with that plate? Let me take it for you. I mean, they just, it, everyone served everyone. And it was Acts chapter 4, nobody needed anything. Uh, I didn't even need to clean my plate. Come on. I mean, it was that good. And, and, it's, and then the teaching's amazing. And uh, I'll let Mario and, and Jonathan kind of share what they got out of that. But uh, I'm telling you, it's something that... Um, I wouldn't mind even taking a group next year. I wouldn't mind taking a group because I think if you see it, you'll catch the vision of what it's supposed to be. Pastor says it. He says, I don't want to be a, known as a super pastor. He says, I want to know, be known as a super church, that the people understand that this is the church of the Bible. Um, he's a, I, I'm going to give you one last thing. He's a black man, and uh, we, uh, Van Gill asked him one time, and he says it very proudly. He says, why is it? that other black ministers, prominent black ministers, voted for Obama. He says when they knew what he stood for, and he basically said, he says, because they voted their culture, not their king. And it was a black man. We need to understand that we need to vote the, co the king and not our culture. In fact, we need to live the king and not our culture. Are you hearing me, church? I'm telling you, it's, uh, we've got a, I've got a word for you today, and uh, it's straight from the throne room. It's straight from the throne room. Uh, but let me let these guys have a moment. Um, I'll say for myself that, you know, I can talk for hours about the teachings that we were able to, to see and stuff, but what stuck out to me the most was the community of these people. You know, um, on the way over there, I really, I didn't know what to expect. I wasn't really sure I wanted to go even. Um, <laughs> and so on the way over there, you know, I, I kind of, I really didn't know what to expect. And when we got there, you know, they have the church and there's houses all around the church. And when service starts, people just walk out of the front door and walk to service, you know. And for me, I know it was difficult being served by people because from service to lunch, all the chairs would have to be put away and then all the tables would have to be brought out. And so I'm so used to, you know, doing something, you know, I'm so used to moving chairs or doing something and it was weird to just stand there and not do anything. It was almost uncomfortable, but in, in a good way, if that makes sense. Um, and the people were just, you know, like I said, I can go on and on about the teachings that we had, but it's what stuck out to me the most was the people that were there. Um, when we got into town, I had two or three text messages from different people that I met there, making sure we got home okay, you know. And I had only met them five days ago. You know, so it was the generosity and the love of the people. It was just such an unconditional love, considering I have never met them before, you know. And so out of everything from this past week, that's what stuck out to me the most. Well, I got to say, um, <clears throat> my favorite part was the part of uh, not having to do my own dishes. No, it, well, I guess my second favorite is that the guests were in line first when it came to mealtime. So just talking about the culture and how these people live, you know, we see things and we read things in the Bible and we think, well, that's not for our days, that's not for our times, because we're different and we've evolved and whatever excuses we give. But I come to realize that it's nothing but an excuse, you know. We tend to lie to ourselves, but then again, it's not even lying to ourselves, it's believing what we're told according to our culture, and, and opposed to seeking our spirit, to seeking the Lord, we're, we're comfortable with what our culture tells us, and, and it, it, it diverts us away from living our spiritual lives in spirit and in truth the way we're called to in, in the Word of God. So that, that was something that impact, it, it impacted me so much that I, I came to the understanding that the God of wrath and the God of, of judgment was for those that don't know that God. Because after Christ, he's, he's not God, but he becomes Father. He becomes that gentle God that loves us and takes care of us and wants to, to, to be there with us. But not in a form to spoil us, but in a form to grow us. That we would know him more. And that we would be able, out of that overflow, to reach out to others and that they would also know him more. So it, it was a great experience. I'm really grateful that I was able to go. It was really nice. I've been praying for a renewing of the mind for years now. 
And I believe that the Lord was setting me up for this week because I can feel it. My brain still hurts from so much information. I mean, it, it's, Pastor put it the best. I expected to drink out of a water hose, and it was a fire hose that I was drinking out of. I was choking on this stuff. It was so awesome and so great. But I, I know that by God's grace, as I go on and continue to meditate on what I've heard and what I've learned, I'm going to start, that renewing of the mind is going to come to completion. You know, to touch on what uh, Brother Marty sh shared, you know, sometimes we walked in because we were talking and, you know, dinner started at 530 and we walked in at 545 or so because service wasn't until seven. And uh, we would sit there, we'd walk in and we'd get in the back of the line and you'd see the church members, they'd be like this and he'd be like, and they'd get out of line so that we could move up to the front, even though we were late. Yeah, it's kind of a silent moment, huh? I sat there, and, and sometimes the kids, I mean, the kids were like this, and they were excited because all the guests they thought had eaten, or as far as they knew, and we'd come in a little late because we were talking, or I was on the phone with somebody, or whatever, and um, I'd walk in late, and then the, the, I call her the mama patrol, you know, she'd, she'd come out of the back, she says, excuse me, children, you have guests behind you, and he'd be like, no, I don't, and they turn, and they walk away, and I'm like, I'm sorry, I didn't ask, I said, it's okay, he said, no, the guests are served first. That was all week. That was, you know, breakfast, lunch, and dinner. And then uh, lunch, this year they actually scaled it back a little bit. Last year, I actually skipped dinner because it was too much food. Yeah, even for me, it was just too much food they were trying to feed us. And um, they scaled it back a little bit, you know, but there was this one, I think it was a Thursday lunch that Jonathan, I think, fell in love with the church. Because it was his macaroni and cheese, he said that he just had to get the recipe for, you know. Uh, we had turkey, gravy, uh, stuffing, chicken, macaroni and cheese. and But we were real good on the desserts, right, Brother Mario? I had this one dessert that was uh, oatmeal and fruit. I mean, it was blackberries and the oatmeal was a crust, but it was oatmeal and fruit. It was good. It was good. Anyway, it was a great time. It was a great time. And uh, hopefully we can, uh, well, I'm going back next year. I know that. Oh, the good news is Pastor uh, Franklin said he may want to come down here and visit us in July. So uh, I'd love to have him. I know you'd love to have him. So um, he is a man that, uh, well, let me give you a little bit of his testimony. Well, yeah, his wife last year was sick. I don't know if those of you know, his wife was, uh, had had an aneurysm, got into the hospital. Then she got a, a blood infection in the hospital. And she was on her deathbed. And that was the time that I went up last year. And uh, they took, I, w I wasn't invited, but they took uh, pastors that he had known. Every, mo every morning or after the afternoon, he'd take off 60 miles to Jackson, Mississippi, where his wife was in the hospital. And he'd grab these pastors and they'd pray. And then they'd come back out. And I would hear them talking, saying, man, it's outside of a miracle from God. It's just not going to happen. It's just not going to happen. And... Um, he just kept saying, you know what, it's, it's, it's not on to death. It's not on to death. And he just kept praying for her. Well, now she's leading worship, playing the keyboard, singing. She's got a complete, uh, uh, she's been restored completely. And she is just the sweetest, sweetest lady. Every time I saw her, she was smiling. And they said that the worship is not the same since she came back from that near-death experience. Her life is not the same. Her joy is not the same because she said, I put everything into perspective. Instead of sorry that I was tired when I got up in the morning, I was thankful that I had another morning to get up. And uh, then one time his testimony was he was talking about in one of his travels, he picked up gangrene on his foot. And he said he got gangrene to where it was rotten to the bone. But he refused to go to the doctor. He's a man of faith. And uh, he was praying and praying, and the Lord said, um, he finally said, if I remember correctly, he said, the Lord brought to mind a scripture about he bore our pain. So that God took away the pain, though it was still the way it was. He no longer had pain. He said it was so bad that his wife said, something died in this house. Something's dead in this house. And then he finally showed his wife his foot. And she freaked out, wanted him to go to the doctor in the hospital. And he says, no. And uh, he said that he went on for, I think it was a few months, if I remember correctly. 
And in this time, he says, I, I, I finally got delivered from the pain, but I did not. I always saw this. And I said, Lord, is this my thorn in the flesh? You know, this is not looking good. He, he kept saying it was rotten to the bone. And the Lord finally, one day, he said, when he was praising and worshiping, he felt the release from the Lord. It says, I've, I've removed from you what needs to be removed. And within three days, all of his skin grew back and you couldn't tell from his feet that he ever had gangrene in the first place. And uh, he was saying, God still heals. God still delivers. But except we want it within 24 hour period. They said something else before I get into the word. And this is kind of where we're going today. They said this, when you get a cold, don't call it a 24 hour cold and don't downgrade it because a cold is there for one purpose, to kill you. I said, I, I asked Pastor Terry, is the associate pastor, I said, explain to me your, your reasoning. And he goes, okay, if all sickness is from the pit of hell, then even a common cold is from the pit of hell. Does that make sense? And I said, well, yeah. And he says, so understand this. He says, a cold can lead to congestion, can lead to pneumonia, can lead to death. He says, any sickness that comes upon your body has to be prayed against as if it were cancer. He says, because no sickness is from our Father, which abides in heaven. And we have to understand that. See, our mentality is, oh, it's a cold. I'm going to go to Walgreens. I'm going to get some, some this and that. And we pray, Lord, would you heal me? And we kind of go on and we don't put any effort into the prayer. He says, we put effort into any sickness that attacks us. He says, like it was cancer, because all sickness is not from God. It's from the other one. So all sickness can lead to death. I said, wow. I said, we're lazy Christians, aren't we? Oh, it's just cold. I'm going to go to Walgreens. I'm going to do this. Oh, it's just that. We, when we get scared is when it's the real, the real big ones. Then we get really scared, and then we really pray. But you know what he was saying? He says, you know, it's kind of like working out. If you work out with a five-pound dumb weights, and eventually you're going to get to the 10-pound. Eventually, you're going to get to the 15-pound. Eventually, you're going to get to 20, 30, 40, 50-pound dumbbells. He says, if you can't pray against the cold, how will you ever pray against cancer? Come on. We need to get a little bit different vision, don't we? That even a cold, we're going to pray because we understand that it could lead to death and it's not from our Father. Amen? Well, open your Bibles to Hebrews chapter 4. I've got a word I guarantee you from the throne room today. It is a good word. I'm, I'm excited about it. Uh, I'll tell you another thing I'm excited about. I got challenged over there. It's funny. I hear that no preachers preach about the blood. That was from Pastor David and, and Pastor Segovia. Uh, Tino and David told me that. And over there where we have these great minds that are professors and teachers and stuff, uh, we have uh, Dr. Timothy Warner. Uh, he was down there. We call him Van Gill to part Dukes, you know, because he's just, he's there, you know. And uh, he was saying, he says, you know what I never see? And I said, what is it you never see? He says, I never see preachers preaching the words of Jesus. I said, huh? And he goes, I never see preachers preaching the word of Jesus. I said, what do you mean? And he says, the words of Jesus are life. He says, so the words of Jesus are life. He says, and they're strong. And so preachers would rather preach about the love of God and all these other things than what Jesus actually said because they're very strong. He's, did you know? Did you all know that Jesus called a woman a dog? If you know that, raise your hand. If you didn't know that, raise your hand. See, most of you didn't know that. He actually called a woman a dog. Not once, but twice. Don't worry, we'll get there. Because what God challenged me on starting this Thursday is we're going to have what I call the Red Letter Series. I will be preaching every Thursday just on the words of Jesus. And it will include Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. It will include the little bit of, of Acts that he speaks before the ascension. And it will include Revelation at the end. I don't know how long this is going to take. I think it's going to take months. Okay? But we're going to be preaching the Red Letter Series. It's going to be just about the words of Jesus. Amen? Hebrews chapter 4, verse 12. It says, For the word of God is quick and powerful and sharper than any two-edged sword, piercing even to dividing asunder of soul 
and spirit and of joints and marrow and is a discerner of the thoughts and the intents of the heart. Now, if you didn't know that, that's a living words scripture, Hebrews 4.12. Now, the problem is, is we read the scripture, and you know what? The word of God's powerful, amen? It's powerful. And we read the scripture, but we actually don't read it for what it's saying because it says that it, the word of God divides the soul and the spirit, the joints and the marrow. It's sharp, and it cuts. Somebody say amen. It cuts. It's sharp, and it cuts. In fact, that's why nobody wants to read it. Because it actually is sharp enough to cut. So sharp that it cuts and it divides your soul and your spirit. Now, what's your soul and what's your spirit? Your soul is this man, this fleshly man. It's what makes you unique. It's what makes you who you are. It's what who you are under pressure. It's who you are under grace. It's who you are here on this earth. But the spirit is that which communes with God. So the word of God, sharper than any two-edged sword, actually divides what? The soul from the spirit. Now, Living Word Church is not called Living Word just because. It's Living Word because of Hebrews 4.12. And the, pro pre the thing is, is the Living Word divides the soul and the spirit. Now, how many of you know that we need to separate the soul and the spirit? Mm -hmm. That's what I thought. That's what I thought. You are body, soul, and spirit, and you need to understand. Your body and soul work together, and your spirit is something different. And you need to separate your soul and your spirit. You need to understand the difference. Let me show you this. 1 Corinthians 15, 45. I will warn you ahead of time that during this word, your flesh will be struggling with your spirit because your flesh does not want you to hear this word. So overcome. How many say I'll overcome? Your, your flesh will battle with your spirit right now because the word is going to. How many of you know that when you cut yourself it hurts? There's going to be some cutting here today. And your body and your soul is not going to want it. But your spirit's going to want it. So there's going to be some cutting here today. And it's not going to be by me. It's going to be by the Holy Spirit. 1 Corinthians 15 40 says and says so it is written. The first man, Adam, was made a living soul, and the last Adam was made a quickening spirit. Now, who is the first Adam? Adam and Eve, right? Does that make sense? Okay, the first Adam. And he's a living soul, and we're like him, right? We're living, and we have souls that need to be redeemed. Now, who's the last Adam? What? What? Jesus is the last Adam. And what that means is that there'll never be another Adam. Okay? You had the first Adam, which was a living soul. Okay? And then you have the last Adam that it doesn't say about his living soul. They said he was a what? A quickening spirit. Okay? So, Jesus was not described that way. Now, the last Adam was, descri last Adam was described as a quickening spirit. And by the way, quickening there in the original language means to make alive, to breathe life into into what your spirit your spirit what did it say first corinthians 15 45 the first man adam was made a living soul that is our bloodline that is our our genetics that is how we are born from our moms and our fathers but the last adam was made a quickening spirit so we have the law of the natural in the first adam and then we have the law of the spiritual in the last Adam, which is Jesus. The problem of the church is that we're always in the natural. That's the problem that we have here in the church. We're always in the natural. We're never in the spiritual. We're not in the spirit. We think we are, but the truth is we're in the flesh. Listen, we, we speak in other tongues. We dance. We fall over. We lift our hands. We prophesy. We, we prophesy on people. We heal the sick. And we think that, that somehow... That's all spirit. But I remind you of Matthew that says, But Lord, Lord, didn't we prophesy in your name? Didn't we heal people in your name? Didn't we do those things? And Jesus said, Away from me, I never knew you. What does that mean? 
They were operating in the natural. They were operating on the first Adam, and they never had the second Adam because he said, I never knew you. But they were healing in Jesus' name. They were casting out devils in Jesus' name. They were walking in the Spirit, and God says, that's not the Spirit that they're walking in. It's my Spirit that's working through them to get my job done. But these people thought that they were walking in the Spirit because they're prophesying. They think they're walking in the Spirit because they're playing music or because they're preaching or because they're laying hands on the sick and they're seeing supernatural signs, miracles, and wonders. But Jesus said, I didn't know you. Don't, I don't even want to see you. I said it was going to cut today. Sometimes you got to cut away the fat to get to the meat. Amen. We see things and we think that we're in the spirit. We feel things and we think we're in the spirit. But the truth is, is we don't even understand what we see. We don't even understand what, we, what we're doing, what we feel. We don't understand any of it. And we walk right back outside of church and outside of getting in your car and walking away, you're arguing again. You're, 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 you're uh, going back to whatever problems you had again. You're walking out. You're forgetting the sermon again. And you're trying to say that I walk in the spirit. Beloved, that's not walking in the Spirit. See, you're in the world, but not of it. Come on. Why do we walk back to our problems? Why do we go back to our problems? Why do we forget walking out after smiling and loving on each other? We go right back into our vehicles, and we go right back into the world, and we start acting the way we were acting before we got to church. See, Jesus, the last Adam, came to... Quicken your spirit. We're in the flesh in many cases, beloved. We're under the grace of God. We operate in the spirit, but we're not walking in the spirit. For when you walk, it is when you are outside these walls, not just when you're inside. My proof, the condition of the church, the condition of the partners. What goes on that nobody knows about, that's my proof. And you can judge it for yourself because you know your own families. The movies you watch, the music you listen to, the friends and the jokes that you participate in. That is my proof that we're not walking in the spirit, we're walking in the flesh. Beloved. I can't judge my own ministries but I, by all the signs, miracles, and wonders that we have seen over the eight years of our church. I can't judge our ministry on that. And many would. I have to judge my ministry based on my personal relationship with Jesus Christ. You must judge your own walk. I cannot judge it for you. For only you and God know the intimacy that you share. The prayer time that you share. Well, I can only pray five minutes because after five minutes I run out of things to say. Then your heart does not overflow with the love of God that should be flowing out of you like rivers of living water. Well, I don't know. Church over there at Living Words kind of long. I kind of like the hour service and I'm getting out. Well, then you again are not walking in the Spirit because I don't know about you, but the longer I'm in the Spirit of God, the happier I am. We are a self-seeking, self-gratifying, self-promoting, self-centered church when we walk in the natural. We do not serve others first. We do not pray for others first. We don't even think of others first. No, make no mistake, beloved. We are in the natural and not the spirit. Because the spirit is quick, 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 and then we go right back to the natural. Some of us are in the natural in this church right now. You don't like the word I'm giving you because I said before, your flesh is stirring up. Boy, he's really beating on me today. No, I'm telling you the truth so that the truth can set you free. Oh, look at him and his uh, self-righteousness. No, I told you that my ministry will be judged by my intimate relationship with God, not based on signs, miracles, and wonders, because even according to Scripture, the unsaved can do those things. That's a whole other sermon by itself. 
We're in the natural and we're not in the spirit. And it comes naturally because of our sin nature. And I'm going to be honest with you. Most of us are very comfortable with the natural and we're uncomfortable with the spiritual. What's God going to reveal? Van Gill said something and Mario touched on it a little bit. He said, judgment, death is for the unbeliever. Tribulations for the believer. There's a difference. Judgment and death. He says, well, if you're the unbeliever, you're going to be judged. Just like he said, get away from me. I never knew you. Where do you think they're going? If it's not by works that any should boast, where do you think they're going? Judgment and death is for the unbeliever. But for the believer, God has ordained tribulation that you and I can work for the perfecting of the saints. That's why James says, consider it pure joy, my brethren. Why? Because then that means you're saved. If you're be going through tribulation, you're saved. If you're going through judgment, you should repent. Turn with me to John chapter 4, verse 23. John chapter 4, verse 23. Now, I've talked to you about moments of God's glory hitting. Doesn't mean anything about us walking in the spirit, just that the spirit of God has invaded earth like we're always asking for. But let me show you John chapter 4, verse 23. It says, the hour cometh and now is when true, say true, true worshipers shall worship the Father in spirit and in truth. For the Father seeketh such to worship him. Verse 24. God is a spirit. Say spirit. And they that worship him must worship him in spirit and in truth. You see, the worship team can't come up and lead you to a place they've never been on their own private time. And I'm not talking about the mechanicals of playing the instruments. I'm talking about worshiping. It says to worship him in spirit and in truth. In other words, truth coexists with spirit. You can't have spirit without truth. If you have an offense against your brother or sister, you're not going to worship effectively. If you have an offense against your brother or sister, there's no, there's no truth in what you're doing. So there's no spirit in what you're doing. If the worship team is fighting amongst each other, then there's no truth in the worship team and they can't lead. If you come in fighting against husbands and wives or families and adults and children and you're fighting that way, there's no truth in what you're doing. You're not representing, you're not walking in the spirit, so you can't worship in the spirit. Spirit and truth have to coexist. Amen? Listen, I understand the natural precedes a spiritual. I understand that. We live in the world, but my brothers and sisters, we live in the world, but we are not of it anymore. You live in the world. You have to live in the world. You have a mortgage to pay. You have car payments to pay. You have all these bills that you put on yourself that you have to pay. We live in a world, but we're no longer of it. We're no longer of it. We should not be competing with our brothers and sisters on what they have and what we don't have. We should not be competing with our brothers and sisters on, on things that they have that we want to have. We should not be competing with the world and looking like the world. And I'm not just talking about t-shirts. I'm talking about how you dress. Young ladies, modesty is of the Lord. Guys, pick up your pants. It works for you the same way. Modesty is of the Lord. When I walk in the spirit, I'm not walking half naked. When I walk in the spirit, I'm not walking to gain people's attention and try to get people's attention, whether it be a male or a female, based on how I'm dressed. Listen, when I'm walking in the spirit, I'm walking with the king. How do you dress when you walk with the king? 
We live in the world of the natural, but we are not to live like the world anymore. What did the last Adam do again? He quickened what? The spirit. If you're in Jesus, your spirit must be quickened. Jesus quickens the spirit and enables us to worship in the spirit. Now remember, the natural precedes the spiritual, but the spiritual always supersedes the natural. The natural, it precedes it. It goes before it because we live in the world. We're in the world, I understand it, but we're not of it. So though we're living in this world, we're separated, we're put apart. And the supernatural, the spiritual, should overwhelm, should supersede the natural. So when a doctor says you're sick, you can say, but I am healed by the stripes of Jesus and walk in that healing. When somebody says you don't know what you're doing, you're not a good pastor, you're not a good worship leader, you're not a good husband or a good wife, or you're not a good Christian, you can sit there and say, label me all you want, but my God loves me. You see, it's not we're in the world. It precedes the supernatural. I understand it. It precedes the spirit. But when the spirit falls, fish and loaves can feed over 5,000. When the spirit falls, you're healed and you're no longer sick. When the spirit falls, your family is put together the way it's supposed to be, not fighting all the time. When the spirit falls... You walk and talk in things that you didn't even know were inside of you. But when the natural comes out, we get, we get offended. When the natural comes out, we judge. We judge what? We judge God, God's own people that he himself would not judge because they only go under tribulation now, not judgment. When we walk in the flesh, we don't submit when we walk in the flesh, we don't lead. When we walk in the flesh, we don't represent the king. I'm going to share something with you that's not in the notes. I shared with Irene just before service. And uh, you're going to say, well, that's easy for you to say you're a man and you're the husband. But Pastor David said something. And before you shut me off, ladies, before you shut me off, listen to all of it. He said, God does not want a strong-willed woman. I was like, oh, here it comes. It's like, mm. I just kind of sat up, looked around, and said, I'm glad I'm not preaching. He's preaching. He says, God does not want a strong-willed woman. He wants a woman that submits to the husband in everything and becomes one with him. And I was like, okay, now don't shut me off. Listen to what he said. He says, let me give you a biblical principle. He says, he calls himself the groom and we are the bride. Do you think he needs a strong-willed bride to fight against him? He says, that's what he has. A strong-willed bride that fights against him, that doesn't listen to him, that refuses to read his word, that refuses to pray, that refuses to do all these things. It's a good, strong-willed woman we are. He says he needs a submissive wife that will follow him and complete him so that they can do what they've been called to do on this earth. The spiritual always supersedes the natural. He's not telling you not to be strong. He's telling you to be submissive. He's telling you to partner with your husbands because that's what he needs the church to do. The church is doing their own thing. The church is out doing their own thing. We're having picnics. We're having all this different stuff. We're doing a great thing for God. And he says, I never knew you. He needs a wife. That's you and that's me. That submits to his headship. And ladies, if you can't do it to your husbands, then you can't do it to him. Men, if you don't know how to let your wife submit to you and love her and nurture her, it says that men are to love their wives as he, they love their own body, then I guarantee you, you don't know how to submit to your God and your king. The spiritual always supersedes the natural. In other words, the natural may be what we see initially, but in order to worship and in order to serve our Father, we must think, we must act, we must walk in the Spirit. That it's not just signs, miracles, and wonders. The Bible says they 
follow us. That means there's something more important here. Where I'm standing at right now, signs, miracles, and wonders follow. They're behind me. There's something more important than signs, miracles, and wonders. Those are important because they're going to follow me everywhere I go. They're going to follow you wherever you go. There's something more important in the present, right here, right now. There's something more important than signs, miracles, and wonders. It's Jesus. His presence. The intimacy that we should have. The prayer life that we should have. The Bible study that we should have. Otherwise, beloved, it's impossible to be an overcoming Christian. I mean, you ever wonder why you feel nothing in worship? Ever wonder why you get nothing out of the preaching? Ever wonder why things don't seem to work out? You wonder why you're always struggling? You wonder why you're never advancing? You wonder why you're not growing in the Lord? Because you're coming in in the natural and you stay in the natural. And you never walk in the Spirit. Turn with me to 1 Corinthians 2.14. Like I said, I know some of you are struggling with this. And it's because you're so used to thinking with your head instead of allowing your spirit to lead you to discern. You know, I'll be honest with you. I've, I've counseled several of you. I've counseled. We've been friends. We, we work different things. And the, the, the carnal man, the one that thinks up here, is the one that always screws it up. And that goes for me, too. When I think things, I screw them up. You want to know why? Because the carnal man only sees right here. It cannot see in the future. When I ask God, would you speak to my spirit, and I listen to what the spirit is uttering, then I know not only today, but I know tomorrow and the day after and the day after. Oh, how do I justify this statement? John chapter 5, I only do what I see my father doing. 1 Corinthians 2.14, it says the natural man... The natural man receiveth not the things of the Spirit of God. They are foolishness unto him. Neither can he know them because they are spiritually discerned. You see, sometimes I'm preaching up here and you're saying, I don't even understand what he's talking about. What time is it? Are we going to get out of here? That's your natural man, folks. You better crucify that flesh. Because then why even come to church? Are you hearing me, church? Why even come to church? If you're so concerned about what time it is, if you're so concerned about whatever it is outside of what God wants to speak to you today, whether it be through worship or through the preaching, unless you are concentrating on that, you are wasting your time. I said it. Can I say something? Preaching the truth isn't about filling chairs. Preaching the truth is about filling lives. Because the truth sets you free. That's what sets you free. I want to see all of you free. Free to walk in the spirit in and out. When you walk out, you're walking in the spirit. You're taking the spirit with you. You're, you're Jacob's ladder, literally. Angels are descending and ascending on your back. Remember, Jesus said, I am Jacob's ladder. Where's Jesus? Right here, right? And if he is Jacob's ladder, that means you have a ladder. Nancy, you have a ladder that's across, coming up your back into the heavenlies. Wherever you go, it's in you because Jesus is in you, which means there's angels. You're a portal for angels to go up and go down from heaven to come on this earth and do things. So you have the ability to ask angels to come say, I'm here, guys. Use me. Come in here and minister to these people. Jan, the same thing for you. I don't care. What the surroundings look like. I don't care how dark it is. I don't, I don't care. Any, you have the ability with Jesus inside of you to say, Lord, let the angels come and just overwhelm this place. We all have that, but we don't believe that and we don't understand that and we don't use it. That's how I know we don't believe it because we don't use it. Listen, 
If you don't believe a cold can kill you, you won't pray against it like it's cancer. If you don't believe that Jesus is inside of you and you don't understand that he is Jacob's ladder from Genesis 28. If you don't believe that, then you'll never pray it and release him into your house. How many of you want your house and your workplace to be filled with angels? Come on. You want that? It's simple. Ask them. You're the ladder. Isn't that awesome? You're the ladder. You know how many ladders we have in this place right now? How many angels could come down into this place right now if we just believed and said, would you come down and use me right now? But we have a problem believing it. You want to know why? Because you're still living as an unsaved person. You're still living under judgment instead of tribulation. Are you hearing me today, church? So, if you're not operating with God's perspective, how in the world does this work? I need some help. George, you got your Bible with you? No? Mario? Come on up. Who else has got their Bible that likes to read? Mom? Okay, come on up. These are kind of long, so I didn't put them up on the, on the computer today. Turn to uh, Ephesians chapter 4, Mario. The two that we're going to read, they're kind of long. Ephesians chapter 4, verse 17. And then, Mom, you're going to stay up here for a little bit. And then you're going to be in Ephesians chapter 4, verse 11. Okay? What needs to be done? Everyone says, okay, Pastor, you're, I'm, I'm just a little convinced. Maybe a little bit of my spirit is, is starting to get quickened here. What, what needs to be done? What needs to be done? It's Ephesians chapter 4, verse 17 through 24. So I tell you this, and insist on it in the Lord, that you must no longer live as the Gentiles do. In the fertility of their thinking, they are darkened in their understanding and separated from the life of God because of the ignorance that is in them due to the hardening of their hearts. Having lost all sensitivity, they have given themselves over to sensuality so as to indulge in every kind of impurity, and they are full of greed. That, however, is not the way of life you learned. When you heard about Christ and were taught in him in accordance with the truth that is in Jesus, you were taught with regard to your former way of life to put off your old self which is being corrupted by its deceitful desires, to be made new in that attitude of your minds, and to put on the new self, created to be like God in true righteousness and holiness. Amen. How do we walk like Gentiles? How do we walk like the world? The vanity of our minds. We try to figure it all out. What needs to be done? It says, I can figure it out. I'm saved. I go to church. I'm on the worship team. I'm the pastor. I'm an elder. I, 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 I. It's all I and the vanity of the mind. It's no longer, church, about you. It's about God. And we have to get past the vanity of our minds. You must come to serve. You must come to worship. You must come to submit to the leadership of this church. You must come to submit to the leadership of the Spirit. You must come to submit to your brothers and sisters thinking of them in a higher regard than you think of yourself. What is it? We walk in the vanity of our minds. Our understanding is darkened. We're alienated from the life in God. Our heart is blinded because we want things of the world instead of things of God. We're greedy. We're corrupt. We have deceitful lust. You know what deceitful lust means? Oh, I lust after that person. I lust after that car or that house. and I lust after this. I, but it's deceitful because you're never truly happy even if you get what you want. It's time. Say it's time. It's time for the church to put on the new man. To walk in the spirit. 
and not walk in the vanity of the mind. It's time to renew our spirit. It's time to allow Jesus to quicken our spirit. It's time to put on holiness. It's time to put on righteousness. It's time to walk in the spirit, not in spurts, not in stutters, but every waking moment of our lives till Jesus comes. You say, I want that, Pastor. I'm tired of falling, of failing. I'm tired of not having peace in the house. I'm, I'm tired of not having peace at work. I'm, not t- I'm tired of, of never seeming to grow, never seeming to go forward. I'm tired of these things. How do I do that? I'm glad you asked. Ephesians chapter 4, 11 through 16. And he himself gave some to be apostles, some prophets, some evangelists, and some pastors and teachers for the equipping of the saints for the work of ministry, for the edifying of the body of Christ, till we all come to the unity of the faith and the knowledge of the Son of God, to a perfect man, to the measure of the stature of the fullness of Christ, that we should no longer be children tossed to and fro and carried about with every wind of doctrine by the trickery of men in the cunning craftiness by which they lie in wait to deceive, but speaking the truth in love may grow up in all things into him who is the head Christ and from whom the whole body joined and knit together by what every joint supplies, according to the effective working by which every part does its share, causes growth of the body for the edifying of itself in love. And And he himself gave some to be apostles, some prophets, some evangelists, and some pastors and teachers. Who gave? He himself. Who's he himself? Jesus, God. What did he give? He gave apostles, he gave pastors, he gave teachers, he gave evangelists, he gave prophets. What did he give these for? To lead you, to perfect you, to put you to work, and to edify you. That's why he did it. And if you don't submit to that which he gave to the church, not we gave ourselves. He gave to the church. If we don't submit to that leadership, however it's brought out, whether it's an evangelist that comes and visits or the pastor or the elders or whatever it is, because you think you've got it all figured out, then the leaders can do none of these things for you. We can't edify you if you don't listen to what we say. We can't build you up if you don't submit to the leadership. We can't do any of these things. We can't help you perfect yourself. We can't help you. Listen, if you can't listen to me because you've got a problem with me right now, then you're missing the word that's coming out through me because God uses imperfect vessels. You're missing it, not me. God chooses to use the foolishness of this world. How many times have I called myself a fool for God? I don't have a problem with it because I'm an instrument for him. You have to submit. You have to submit. You have to come to serve one another. You have to walk around, you know. Worship team, if George is talking to you, and you need to ask George, what do you need? George, you got to ask your team, what do you guys need? you got to serve one another. Elders, you got to ask me what I need. i got to ask you what I need. Brothers and sisters, we got to ask each other, what do you need? How can I help you? How can I serve you? Can I get you a bottled water? Can I, can, I, can I do something for you? Can I help you? Can I, can I, can I take you out? Whatever it is, I need, I need to figure it out. I need to do something for you because I hold you in a higher esteem than I hold myself. You have to submit. Say submit. Till when? Verse 13. Until there's a unity of our faith. Till there's a knowledge of Jesus the Christ. Till you and I become perfect. Till you and I have the fullness of Christ. Till you and I are no longer acting or looking like children. Till you and I grow up in Him. In all things, we're like Him. 
In all things, we're like him. Submit till when? Till we fit together like the joints of the body. That's how long and how much we submit and we serve to one another. So when is that? When will we reach that perfection? Anybody? When Jesus comes. So what is he telling the church to do? What is God telling you today? He's telling you to separate your natural mind and discern in your spirit and walk in the spirit. What is he telling you today? He's saying, till I come, until I pull you out of this world, until those things, God is saying you're to submit to one another. You're to go under the leaders that I myself have put on this church or any other church. You're to submit. You're to stop thinking with this vain mind. You're to discern with the spirit. You're to become knowledgeable of Jesus being reading your Bibles. You're to become perfect. How do you become perfect? Because you're like him. You're to have the fullness of Christ. I guarantee you, none of us have the fullness of Christ in our lives right now. None of us. You're to grow up. Say grow up. You're to grow up in Him. In what? It says in all things. All things. What does that mean? Your marriages, grow up. Your tithes, your offerings, your money, grow up. Your household, what you watch, what you allow your children to do, grow up. You're to grow up in all things. Why? Because he's coming back for a bride that's mature, not a child. A bride without spot or blemish, a submissive bride that's submitted in her waiting for her husband to come. See, let me just put it in in plain English for you. You know what's awesome? When a woman is waiting one day, she's, you know, she's 15, she's 16, she knows she's going to be married one day. And what she does is she saves herself. She knows no man saving herself for the time that her husband comes to take her from her family. That's awesome. Isn't that awesome? That's what the white, white dress is about. Are you hearing me, church? So now let's go back to the spiritual. God is waiting to see, are you preparing yourself? Are you waiting? Are you watching stuff you shouldn't watch? Are you listening to stuff? Do you have friends that you should walk away from? Do you have these things in your life? The whole time spilling stains upon your dress. Or are you putting yourself aside like the wise virgins putting oil, waiting for the groom to come, perfecting yourself, growing up, In all things, waiting for the groomsmen, the king of kings, the Lord of lords, to come and to take you into an eternity that will never end. Are you waiting for that, church? Are you preparing yourself for that? Are you just coming to church because it's Sunday afternoon? Are you just coming to church because it's Thursday night? Are you just coming because this church seems to be nice and that's all? Do you just kind of come? Or are you preparing yourself? Are you growing up in all things? Look, we have a long way to go, don't we? And I'm saying we. I'm in this journey with you. I don't claim to be a super Christian. My God. I walk in grace every day. I'm just willing to be the fool that gets behind the pulpit at this church. Because that's what he calls us. Fools. Why? Why? Because the world calls it foolishness, doesn't it? Let me ask you a question. How in the world does some guy get up here and preach and yell at you and and do whatever he does? How in the world is that going to change anything? It's kind of foolishness to think it would, isn't it? But when the spirit flows, it allows the spirit that's inside of you to be quickened. And suddenly, what is foolishness up here and with this becomes wisdom and eternal right here with the Spirit. I have a long way to go, beloved. But I don't know about you, but I would love to take the journey with you. I'd love to be together when the trumpet sounds and the archangel shouts. 
I don't know, was last Sunday we went pizza, George? Was it last Sunday? Me and George were in the back of the line. We were in the back of the line because there was a lot of us that went to go eat. And we're in the back of the line, and we've been waiting for an hour. It's hot. We're sweaty. And we're like, well, we're going to get whatever chair we get. They're going to sit us wherever they want. And we're walking like this, and then the, all of a sudden we see everybody reversing, and the little girl that's going to go sit us is going like this. And I'm the last one. George is right in front of me. And we both turn around, and George turned like a little kid and got all spiritual on me because he started quoting scripture. And the last will be first. He says, praise God. God is good. He's like, we're going to get to sit wherever we want. We're going to get the pizza first. We're going to get our drinks first. You know, he's like, the last will be first. And I was, I, I was agreeing with him. It's like, hallelujah, here I go. Which way, young lady? Okay, right. Hmm. It's George, you want, all right. It was funny, George, how we got excited, and that was just pizza, right? Hey, come on, you've gotten excited for pizza before, all right? I've seen it. How excited do you think it's going to be when you hear that archangel shout? When that trumpet blows, and you see graves opening up, and it, not here, up here, you're like, What's going on? There's planes falling out of the sky. There's, there's a, but right here, you have discernment that the groom is coming. And he's about to sweep you up and put you in a place that you'll never, ever go through tribulation again. I mean, we got excited for that. We quoted scripture. I'm telling you, I'll be quoting scripture in those milliseconds I have. I'll be going, oh, glory. Glory, glory when he comes. And at that time, I'll decide, did I prepare myself for this? Or is he suddenly coming upon me? Do I have my dress on like the wise virgins? Am I, have I grown up in all thy ways? Or have I walked like this all the days of my life? Church, only you can answer that question. But I'll tell you this, with the Red Letter series that's coming on Thursdays and with what God is doing now with other things that I need to share with you, we can take that journey together. Not a journey of this, a journey of this. Preparing, growing up in all things. Would you stand to your feet? Beloved, we're going to have communion right now. George, can you sing one song for communion? Thank you. <laughs> what? Okay. I thought you said a lot of songs. I was like, okay. Just close your eyes. They're going to be giving you the elements in a second, but I want to read this to you. 1 Corinthians eleven twenty four. And when he had given thanks, he broke it and said, Take and eat. This is my body, which is broken for you. Do this in remembrance of me. And in the same manner, he also took the cup when he had supped, saying, This cup is the New Testament in my blood. Do this ye as often as you drink it in remembrance of me. For as often as you eat this bread and drink this cup, you do show forth the Lord's death till he come. Wherefore, whosoever shall eat this bread and drink this cup of the Lord unworthily shall be guilty of the blood and the body and the blood of the Lord. But let a man examine himself, and so let him eat of that bread and drink of that cup. For he that eateth and drinketh unworthily eateth and drinketh damnation to himself, not discerning the Lord's body. For this cause many are weak and sickly among you, and many even sleep. Now I'll just give you a reminder, the bread that you have here is called matzah bread. It is a bread eaten during Passover in celebration of the exodus out of Egypt. And there's laws on how they prepare it. It's unleavened, meaning there's no yeast in it. It's baked. It's pierced with holes, if you look at it. It's striped. 
And though the Jews didn't know what they were doing, let me give you a Christian perspective. It's unleavened, and leaven represents sin. Yeast represents sin. So this is without sin, this bread, because yeast represents sin. It is baked, which means it was burned with God's wrath and fury against our sins. Remember on Easter, I preached to you that the reason Christ was sweating blood was because he was about to take on the wrath of God. He was not afraid of dying. He wasn't even afraid of the, of the whippings and the scourge. He was afraid and he feared the wrath of an almighty God. And my proof of that was the Christians who have died in the same manner that have died singing and worshiping. Those, there, I even heard of a Christian that was about to be burned and he said, don't worry, my God has already told me I won't feel any pain when I die. And God took all the pain and the man stood there singing to the Lord, burning at the stake. Are these men and women that have died like this greater than the Lord? Absolutely not. But it was because he was about to take the wrath. What you and I deserve. That's why he sweated drops of blood. And the reason this is burned is because it's, it represents God's wrath and his fury against our sins. It's pierced, obviously, for his hands, his feet, and the side. It's striped because of the lashes on his back. So when you come to the Lord's table, make sure you discern the body. You're not just eating a cracker. You're not just doing that. You're eating something that represents a man, a God, that took the wrath so you don't have to. Jesus took the bread and broke it because he was going to be broken. He took the brokenness so that you could be whole, beloved. Now, I want you to close your eyes, and I want you to imagine Jesus' eyes just looking at you, burning in love, as he sits across the table of you, as he hands you the cup and the bread. And he hands you the cup at this very moment. Imagine it. He hands you the cup at this very moment. And he says, this is my blood. The blood that I shed for you. The blood that paid the price so that you don't have to. And then he says, drink it. Go ahead and drink it. Then he breaks the bread that represents him. Represents everything that you and I should have gone through. Deserve to go through. And he hands you this piece of bread. He says, my daughter, my son, see the holes in it? Those are for my hands and my feet. See the stripes? Those are the ones that will be upon my back and my front very soon. See the burned part? That's the wrath of God that I'm taking for you. Discern my body. Understand what I've done for you. Hallelujah. Now before you take this bread, if you're sick today, I want you to imagine him taking on your sickness. Put it on him right now. Whatever sickness it is, high blood pressure, diabetes, whatever it is in your life, I want you to put it on him right now. I want you to imagine that sickness moving from you into his body right now. And listen, before you get all self-aware and all that, understand something. You put your sins on him. Okay? If you confess Jesus as your Lord and Savior, you've already put your sins on him. So put your sickness on him right now. He died for your sickness as much as he did for your sin. And when you've done that, then take the bread and eat it.
Let me pray and then we're going to worship. Father, we thank you for your broken body and the covenant blood that you spilled. It is for healing for my body. It is for healing for my spouse's body, for my children's body. Thank you for the stripes upon your back. Thank you for the beatings that you bore. Thank you for the forgiveness that you've washed me white as snow, that I no longer walk in sin but walk in the Spirit. As I drink, I celebrate and partake of the inheritance of a son or of a daughter. In Jesus' name, amen. I'm going to leave you with this, and then I'm going to let George do whatever God's put on his spirit. Mario and I came to an agreement. We said that we would... Um, We would keep each other on this. I'm no longer going to call God, God. I'm going to call him Father. He is the God of the Bible, the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. He is the God of the Ten Commandments. He is the God of the everlasting life. He is all those things. But when I confessed Jesus and when I came into the kingdom, I became a son of the Most High God. And a son, I don't go to my dad and say, uh, Mr. Hernandez, how are you doing today? I say, Dad, how are you doing today? Make sense? We need to get out of condemnation and we need to start walking in inheritance and relationship, and joy, and peace. Because my Father has my best intentions in mind. My Father has my eternity all wrapped up neat and put aside. My Father would never give me a scorpion or a rock to eat, but would give me something good to eat. My father doesn't want me sick. My father wants me to be married and happy. My father wants me to raise, have my son be blessed. My father wants to bless me. And I don't go to my dad and say, Mr. Hernandez. I say, Dad. So I can say Father or I can say Abba, Father. Do you know what Abba means? Daddy. So I've made, we've made a agreement that we would catch each other. And I'll be honest with you, I didn't realize how many times I say God instead of Father. I've had to correct myself many times in just a day or so. Oh, well, God's going to take care of you. I mean, Father. is gonna, Nancy, if I sit there and say, you know, whatever, whatever problem you have right now, God's going to take care of you. You're going to say, all right, God's almighty. God's great. Nancy, whatever you're going through right now, our Father is going to take care of you. You see the difference? I'm telling you, you should, you should join us. Not to disrespect him. Don't get religious on me. To acknowledge the relationship that he paid for on that cross. That I am no longer a fallen creation. I am redeemed. I am righteous. I am holy. I am upright. Why? Because my father says so. Who's going to argue with my father? Who's going to win that argument? Nobody. Nobody. So from now on in my life, he is father and he is Abba. He is daddy. From this day forward. And I charge you, if you hear me in personal talk referring to him as God, Say, didn't you say he's your father? Because I'm going to change the way I talk. I don't know if you know this. I used to cuss like a sailor. I mean, I cuss so much, my dad would say, boy, you got to clean your mouth. And I was like, I, I just, I thought it was English. I just cussed like a sailor. And I had to make a decision. And I made a decision one day, and it just started to clean itself out of me. Because out of the abundance of the heart, the mouth speaks. 
See, I, my heart has spoke of my God, my God, my God. And now it's going to speak of my father, my daddy. He's good, isn't he? He's good, and he wants to be your father. He is your God. He, in fact, he's God even over those that refuse to acknowledge it. He's still God. But to those of us who have submitted as a bride unto her husband, for those of us that have relationship, he's Abba, Father, good daddy that loves me and loves you. Do you love him today, church? Then call him daddy. Call him daddy. forgiven because you are forsaken I'm accepted you were condemned I'm alive and well your spirit is within me because you died and rose again I'm forgiven I am. 